Welcome to the Present Fathers Podcast. This is the show that focuses on climbing the mountain of fatherhood together. We believe that dads matter. That's why this show is for you. So gear up, dads. Get ready. It's time to start climbing. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Present Fathers Podcast. Our guest today is Matt Baudreau. And uh, this is one I've been really looking forward to for a long time. Uh, Matt has a very uh, interesting uh, way of kind of breaking down education, and he's doing a, a really revolutionary thing, uh, I think, with his current program. So we're going to dive into that. Matt, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Honored, honored brother. I uh, appreciate you guys very much. Sweet, man. I'm, I'm really glad you're here and uh, really excited to kind of unpack everything and, and uh, get through this, because I think this is probably one of the most important topics that parents need to be made aware of. Uh, and we'll get into that. I don't want to jump too far ahead. But you know, this one really when I first kind of learned about you and, and digging into what you know, you've talked about and, and what you're doing, it really opened my eyes to a lot. So I think that this is gonna do the same for a lot of other people. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. But if you don't mind, let me do a quick little bio on you before we dive into uh, everything. But you're the founder of the Acton Academy Placer and the Acton Academy Sacramento. And then uh, you have been a career educator. You've done TED Talks, consulted with universities, written books, uh, and you've created multiple programs uh, to kind of revolutionize education, um, a much more practical approach. You have your Essential 11 podcast um, and a whole bunch of other things. I'm really kind of skimming the surface here, but uh, you also have the Apogee program, right? That's a separate thing. So um, yeah. A whole lot of things. I know you're you're engaged in a lot of different areas and yeah. uh, have been doing a lot of work. So we'll get into that later. But I just wanted to kind of level set for everyone. Um, awesome. And yeah, so why don't we start with your background in education, kind of where you even got started on this whole journey and kind of yeah. how that eventually led to you realizing there was a problem that needed some fixing. For sure, man. And even what we're doing with Apogee, you know, I always tell people all of those things that you were just mentioning there, talking about anything we get to do speaking the schools um you know the mentorship programs everything we're doing there they're all different fingers but they're on the same hand you know it's it's all getting back to reseeding a free and sovereign society of families through education right it's redefining what education means to people i think words matter um very very much and and we say things we assume that everybody else thinks the same thing we do when we say those words and it gets us in trouble. You know, the biggest problem with communication is assuming that it took place and it almost never has to, to the extent that we really would like it to. So words very much matter. And so we'll, you know, we'll do a lot of, I'm sure, defining words, um, you know, in today's program. So, uh, you know, I tell people, yeah, career educator. And um, the way that panned out was I turned down a job at the White House uh, coming out of college. And so was at that point went cool, man, now what? Um, you know, I had no idea, like many others coming out of school. Well, what do I do? You know, now, now what do I do? How do I do this adult thing? Um, I'd worked forever and, and I had, you know, taken care of myself. I'd been out of the house for a long time, but I'm like, I don't know who I am and I don't know what I have to offer the world. And so I guess now I'm supposed to figure it out now that I'm 22, right? Versus I'm not really sure what I was going to school for. Isn't that what it's supposed to be for? So, you know, that was one of those questions that kind of kind of struck me at that point, but had to figure it out. So, you know, series of odd jobs um, and a very specific course uh, led me to Stanford University. I saw started to see the game from the inside out at Stanford. Um, and when I say the game, I mean the game of school. And it's wait, it's supposed to be this meritocracy of that's how you get into. Oh, wait, it's not actually a meritocracy. Oh, wait. All right. You start seeing all these these dominoes start to fall. And um, so I figured, okay, well, naively, not knowing what I didn't know, um, I'm like, well, I'll fix this from the from the ground up, right? Let's let's not put a Band-Aid on this. Let's go ahead and get right to the root of the problem and see if I can fix these cuts before they take place. So public school teacher getting reprimanded there. I was what I called creatively insubordinate and um, was, was very much playing the... Uh, you know, I got pulled into a superintendent's office and he's like, okay, we got a problem. I'm like, yeah, well, there's definitely some problems. And he's like, we got a problem though. But here's, here's the thing. You're loved by everybody. You're everybody's favorite. You're the student's favorite. You're the other teacher's favorite. Your administrator even really likes you. Um, but you don't do anything you're told. And that's an issue. I'm like, well, 
I don't do anything I'm told because of the issue. I don't know that I'm it. I probably, I'm an HR nightmare. I know I'm an HR nightmare, um, but still, you know, it's, there's a reason for it. So uh, again, naively, I'm like, well, I'll just become the site administrator and then that's how I'll fix it. So you go get your, you know, admin credential and you go, wait a second, we're not talking about kids at all. We're talking about money, power, politics, but we're not talking about kids. Um, so naively jump ship to private. Private looks just like public and they're modeled after public. You know, you just have people paying. Uh, but it's the same problems. It's the same issues. It's the same conveyor belt system. Um, so seeing all those things, ultimately, I let, you know, led me to leave and, and start my own campuses, which I was glad to be able to do because I have children of my own. And my oldest was getting to the point where she was going to need to go somewhere uh, and she wasn't going anywhere that I'd ever seen. So I needed to build something for her. So that's when that took off building schools. Speaking career took off simultaneously and, and non-planned and um, but that ended up being just an extra blessing. So that kicked all of it off. And it's been a wild time since then, too. That's amazing. Um, can you define a little bit what some of those dominoes are, some of the, you know, the systemic issues of the conveyor belt system that, you know, you were having to get called into the the office for being insubordinate about? Yeah. Um, what I always, I always frame these conversations with a couple of things that I want people to keep in mind as they listen. One, I'm going to uh, speak very negatively of the conveyor belt system. Please understand that is not me speaking negatively about the teachers or administrators in that system. By any stretch of the imagination, I have nothing but respect and love for those people. If there are good humans that are there, are there negative people, you know, negative human, bad humans that are in that system? Of course there are. Sure. There are, and there's bad anesthesiologists too, right? There's like... There's bad people everywhere, right? But if they're good ones, I'm on their side, man. I'm on their team. So I'm speaking about the system itself. Um, and then the other thing I want people to understand is they're going to hear some things. And logically, most people can get on board with the majority of what I say the majority of the time. That's rarely the issue. The issue is usually an emotional one um, because they have that emotional tie to what school is. And in their mind, again, words matter. In their mind, school is synonymous with education. The way I frame it is it's actually the enemy of. What should school be for? What should education be for? I just started talking about I was 22 and I came out and I had no idea who I was. I don't know, maybe you guys at 22, maybe you guys knew everything. Maybe you had a, a great amount of self-awareness. Maybe you knew what all your gifts were. Maybe you knew exactly where you're going and maybe you had spent that entire 20 years getting there, right? Maybe your listeners, that was their experience too. In my experience, the majority of people, that was not it. So when I'm teaching and I'm working with young people in a very rough area of California who are being raised by gang members or maybe their families or, you know, family members are in prison. They're being told as middle schoolers to go home and start selling drugs from the porch. And I'm going, Hey, I actually see some amazing things in you. You're a brilliant human being. Uh, you're wildly intelligent. You are actually extraordinarily, uh, talented you're really fun like hey man let's go build a life that's not going to bring you to prison so let's focus on what we need to do and what does that life actually look like and i'm so here's where i'm mentoring these young people but i'm being told algebra I'm like no it's not algebra for this guy that's not what he needs right now and guess what he may never actually need that no he needs it because the school needs it because all of them need it at this age you need it our funding is determined based on it, right? Everybody, same thing, same time. So I get it from the administrative standpoint. They're wanting to make sure they keep their role. They want to get the money. I want to impact children. And by the way, I've got teachers and administrators that reach out to me daily. And they have for years saying, I'm with you. I want to impact kids. I got into this for the right reasons. All the altruistic reasons. I want to help them. I am handcuffed to a greater degree than I ever knew I would be. So it was those kind of conversations where you start to go, at least I did, because I'm, a, um, I'm curious by nature. And I'm also willing to ask questions that most people aren't willing to ask because, not because they're not curious, but because they're, they don't want to make somebody else uncomfortable. 
I'm willing to ask a question that makes somebody else think, even though I know that if they don't like what they're thinking about, rather than being mad about people that may have lied to them in the past, they'll get mad at me for making them think about the question. I'm okay with that. That's all right. I'll be the bad guy if it helps them think through something, right? I'm okay with that. So um, I would ask those questions. Um, and I started asking those questions early. Wait, why do we do school like this? I recognized that this was a game when I was four. Clearly remember recognizing the game at four years old. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it was, I was asking that question, why? And then when I started going down the rabbit hole of actually trying to answer that question, you start to find out that the whole system is built on control and obedience. Yep. And it's not, it's not about child development at all. Um, right. Man, everything. So why, that's a good launch point. Why do we, why don't we uh, jump into the history of kind of the, the somewhat dark origins of our modern education yeah. system? Um, and like you, I mean, I, I knew school was a game. My parents even told me that it's a game, you know, and yeah. I, I was real good at it. Really great test taker. You know, I got really good grades all the time because I was really good at playing the game. And for me, it worked out because I joined the military. So, you know, the, the Prussian military background worked out well for me. <laughs> but oh, yeah. right for in. anything else, it would have been terrible. Like, I mean, I, I used to think entrepreneurs were nuts, like guys who wanted to leave high school and start a business. I was like, oh, what a loser, you know? And in hindsight, I'm like, man, genius. I, I, I was the loser. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's true, yeah. man. It is. It's a game. And think about... Again, I'm, I try to use as many parallels as I can because I want people to think through these things logically. If somebody was to spend, like, so George, what did you did you play sports in high school? Yeah, like what a lot of them. What'd you play? Baseball, basketball, taekwondo. Okay, so uh, let's wrestling. Say, so let's talk basketball, right? So if you spent eighteen years, twenty two years, you know, college, whatever, so. You spend all this time growing up and you're learning the ins and outs of basketball, right? And so you got somebody coaching you on that game. And they're like, okay, this is how you this is how you dribble, this is how you shoot, right? You got to keep the elbow in, you got to follow through, right? This is a chess pass, this is a bounce pass. Hey, we're gonna run, you know, zone defense, we're gonna run man defense, we're gonna like this is what it looks like to box out, man. And then you're gonna, you know, we're gonna like you get all of those fundamentals and you're playing that game all day, every single day. And then you get done after all those years and everybody's like cool man are you ready for like an actual game right we've done all these practices all these scrimmages all these things are you ready for an actual game you're like yes and they're like all right cool go ahead and step out here that's first base that's second base that's third here's your baseball bat right and you're like what are you talking about i just spent all the years with this and everybody's like oh no man but it's a game right right and you got a ball that's not the same thing it's not the same. You train to play this specific game. And now you're expected to do this game. And everybody says, well, because there's a ball involved, like it's the same thing. That's ridiculous. You're not going to be good at that automatically. You're going to have to figure out that whole freaking thing. We are telling people and we are convinced as a country, as a nation, as a society, that you go play the game of school and you play it well, well, life works out well. Those are very different games matt you just that described area. michael jordan's ill-fated attempt to move from uh, basketball to baseball so that, <laughs> that was actually a perfect yeah, analogy really, I did. You're right. I didn't think about that. Maybe subconsciously man as a jordan even, even the goat basketball. couldn't do it you know you know that's right and I'm, I'm throwing it out there michael jordan is unequivocally the best basketball player who's ever lived agreed lebron lebron if, you <laughs> if you don't believe what George just said, turn the podcast off right now. <laughs> yeah, un <laughs> unsubscribe, <laughs> never listen again. That's turn right. it off yeah. dude, right now. We are not yeah. friends. Yeah. Um, and I actually don't want you to follow anything I ever say. I think, I think the saddest thing about the situation though, is that it, you know, it, it becomes a person gets out in the real world and it's on the job training, right? They pawn it off to corporations and, and jobs instead of you going and creating your own thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to follow the leader and that's the worst part about it. You always have to. And look, not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur and that's fine. But we aren't designed the same. So why are we all doing the same thing at the same time? We aren't designed to, to just be blindly freaking obedient. And we know that because we're not all wildly fulfilled and joyful 
playing somebody else's game and, and letting somebody else write our script for the rest of our lives. If you're in that corporate environment, listening to somebody else boss you around and you're like, I don't like the boss. I don't really love the job. Ugh, Monday. Ugh. Well, guess what? It's not working for you. I'm not saying obstacles don't exist. I have obstacles all the time, problems all the time. And I'm like, cool, man, par for the course, all good. I don't mind, like, let's rock and roll. Just means we're growing. Here we go. And that's not because I've got, you know, just a, the total optimist mindset, which I'm a, I am optimistic, but it's also because I'm on a mission with a purpose and I feel really good about that. And I'm not answering to anybody else. That's you're not big, playing a game. You're, you're doing the real yeah. deal. They're so. just doing the real deal. Yep. hundred yeah. percent. So school's not meant to get you into that kind of mindset at all um, because that takes self-confidence and it takes self-awareness. You are given the opportunity to develop neither of those in a conveyor belt school environment. Yeah. So let, let's take it back from the beginning then. So can you just level set for the audience on a lot of the history about, you know, cause I think a lot of people don't even realize this. Um, Most people don't. Yeah. Um, I, and I agree. So what I, you know, I always tell people, um, one of my heroes all time uh, is a man that I, I had the honor of connecting with before he passed a few years ago. His name was John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O, a okay? John Taylor Gatto. Go read anything and everything he ever wrote. And you can get a lot of it for free. Um, you know, you can get PDFs online. You can read uh, Secret History of, uh, or the Underground History of American Education. Uh, weapons of mass instruction, uh, dumbing us down. You can. There's a number of books that he has written. I encourage you to go read those because he will do a better job and in more depth um, than I ever will on anything like this. Like it's hours and hours worth of background of understanding of how this played out, then this played out, then this played out. But I, so I try to keep it as general as possible because this right here is enough of a leap within the matrix to make people uncomfortable as it is, right? So schooling, as we know it, this conveyor belt schooling model, schooling was brought to us by the Prussian military. So without going too crazy into it, you know, you got the uh, the military was, they were losing to Napoleon and, and the Prussian military essentially said, hey, look, you know, we got our guys that are, are thinking for themselves and that's a problem. Uh, it's causing all kinds of issues for us. We need a more obedient populace. Well, how are we going to get this more obedient populace? Well, we let's start when they're kids. Like let's let's put them through a system of obedience, um, you know, training that so they're not questioning authority. They're not questioning the government. Um, let's make sure we are in complete control. Let's make sure that they are not going to work too early in developing skills and independence. Let's you know keep them keep them out of the workforce early and make sure that we can really break the spirit of these young people. We want to make sure that it's not like, Hey, we're just, you know, in Kate, like caging your kids. So we have to make it look like they're learning something. Um, and we'll basically put them through a bunch of academia for, you know, this amount of time, but we'll really break their spirit. That's essentially what they were designing that for. And then you had people, the Rockefellers and Horace Mann and, and Dewey and all these people who essentially brought that over um, to our country during the Industrial Revolution and went, cool, man, that works. That's great. Um, we can we can pawn off this idea of a utopian society that's um, essentially really what we're doing is getting people to be ready for obedience, to be led by us, quote unquote, elites. Um, we'll make it sound really good. We'll teach, you know, we'll tell them that we're teaching them or really educating their children so that everybody has equal access to all these things. But what we're really doing is teaching them much about nothing. I want a nation of workers. I don't want a nation of thinkers. Therefore, a whole bunch of money, the equivalent of about one and a half billion dollars was poured into this quote unquote education system to get all kids doing the same thing, same time and bringing everybody over. Now, here's the problem that was done over a hundred years ago. Um, you guys are all good looking guys. I can tell none of you are a hundred years old. Um, and guess what? You don't know, you, me. Uh, you know, <laughs> none of you know anybody that is over, you know, really 110, 115, you don't. Um, so you don't know anybody unless they were home educated specifically. You don't know anybody that hasn't gone through this conveyor belt system. So what does that mean? We have a religion that has taken this country by storm. That's been here for an entire generation. So everybody just is born in this cage 
and they believe this is the way it is supposed to be because for you yep. it's the way it's always been so you don't stop to question why we do it the way we do it and it's nothing to do with education everything to do with being schooled yeah and i mean just think practically for those listening you know of all the people you know don't you all have different strengths and weaknesses so to, to all be graded, you know, uh, what's the quote? It's like, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, its entire life, it will think it's stupid. Bingo. But it, but if you grade it on its ability to swim, it's going to do pretty well, right? So Bingo. it's, it's kind of it's the again, same thing. And again, so every single one of you, all three of you guys, every single person that's listening to this, all of us know people who did extraordinarily well at the game of school and life has not worked out well. They're not good communicators they don't love their job they're not in good health they haven't made you know any money they're not like they're miserable we also know people that sucked at school and are crushing life they're extraordinarily happy they're leaning in they're making money their relationships are great they're in great physical condition like however you want to define success like they are getting after it Right now, I'm not saying it's going to go one way or the. it's not automatically that way. But the problem is, if this was the way to truly educate a population and get them ready to take advantage of those amazing gifts that they have. Well, if we look at society, do you have a society where you go, we are really freaking educated as a society? Gosh, we are really good at communicating with one another. Man, this is a society that looks physically, spiritually, emotionally sound. Gosh, find everybody has got. I don't think you do. I don't look at the society and say any of those things are are where they should be. But we've all gone to school. Well, you you had mentioned uh, one of the quotes that I had written down from you was believing in the unique genius of each child, and mm -hmm. that struck a chord with me so heavily because my son, being ADHD, he just like people want to medicate him and keep him in this one seat the whole day. <laughs> And it's mm -hmm. like, this kid is very engineering minded. And then my daughter's the opposite. She's like this genial, genius level empath and she's very kind and she sees things in a, in a different way. And it's like, I would love and see what I do is basically at home, I have to teach them to their special characteristics because I know the schools are not going to tend to those like, like I would. But yeah. um, I said it to the school in the first place. Yeah, and you had, um, you had said it had all started with a kid Real named question. John. Can you tell us? Tell us about well, no. John. Oh, that's a real question. Why send them to school then? Hmm. Brandon, why send your kids to school? You've got to teach them to their unique genius. So why are you sending them to school? Real question. Hmm. <laughs> well, question. I mean, yeah, man, I, so I'll chip in here. I watched the episode you did with Nick Kimolatsos. And by the end of it, I was like, and we're, we're yeah. we didn't want our daughter to go to public school and have to deal with all this, you know, woke nonsense and so we've been paying to send her to a small christian school that just opened up you know during the pandemic and right. it opened the year that she started kindergarten and I, and then i watched your episode and i was like wow i needed this you know five years ago uh yeah we're, we're gonna transition we're gonna make a change here so we'll, we'll talk after this i'm very serious about yeah, that but, for sure so i want to i mean that's um, again i want to it, wanna it blew my mind i was you have i just want to make sure like i'm going to push back and i want to i want you guys to think through sure. Because what it's going to identify too, it's not anything against you. It's identifying the, the things that I don't hear anything new at this point. I've been doing this for a long time. So I understand the normal trepidation, the normal fears, the normal worries, the normal, like I never thought of that. Like I get all of it. So I like to ask with, you know, I like to ask people to start thinking about, again, I'll ask the question. So like, if you've got to do this for your specific children, which is what you're called to do as a father, by the way, is to, you are the primary educator in their life, period, end of story, you and their mom, primary educators, done, it's over. Like you are those. So since that's a fact, why are we sending them? Why are you outsourcing it? Why are you sending them somewhere else that isn't going to take their specific genius into account? And then you also said ADHD, who made, who made the determination that there's ADHD? What is that? Where did that come from? Who decided that that's a thing? Where did that originate in the first place? Look that up for a while and, and dig into that a bit. What does that mean? How do we define that? 
And for I, record, I don't want to go too far off into a superpower. I just want to state that. Like, well, I, I don't want to go too well. far off into the weeds, but <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you do a little bit of cursory research, you know, the, the stats are, are kind of telling the story now with yeah. all the, with yeah, the rise of all the pharmaceuticals for kids uh, and yeah, yeah. stuff. And I'm, not and, to, I'm not trying to detract. What I'm saying is everything that when we start talking about our kids and we start talking about schools, there are things that we will say. And because so many people say them so often, we all just go, yes, that's a normal thing. And yeah, we don't stop game. and go, wait, what does that mean? And where did it come from? Right. Right. That's a religious. It's, it's, it's blind faith. Yeah. It's yeah. blind faith. It's a religious response. So that's why I ask those questions and push back. So that said, I apologize. I'm not trying to detract, but Brandon, you had said something specifically about. Um, yeah, so you had said it had all started with a, a student named John. So I was just kind of curious about that story. Oh, um, so I believe what you're referring to is a young man. It was at the last conveyor belt school that I ever worked at before I left to start my own. Um, and yeah, it was a young man who was who was essentially considered somewhat um, special again special needs needs a definition right there's a lot of things that need to we need to define he was a brilliant freaking young man and he was awesome um, but he was considered special needs why because he didn't do well at school with the school timeline with the school things um but um yeah he was a he was a young man who essentially came into uh he not even come into the office he called a meeting he's like hey i need to schedule a meeting with you i was an administrator you know, the school and he's like, I need to schedule a meeting with the administrative team. I'm like, you want to just talk like you're at recess right now. You want to, just, you want to just talk because you're 10. Like, do you want to talk? <laughs> he's like, no, I need to schedule a meeting with the administrative team. And it's like, okie doke. Cool, man. Let's uh, schedule a meeting. Right. Like this is what, I mean, he was coming at it. Like this was a teacher that was, you know, it was like, okay, yeah, well, let's schedule a meeting. So we scheduled a meeting for a different day. He came in extraordinarily formally dressed i mean to the nines comes in and he's got um a uh what is it like a like an easel kind of deal with him right and he's like oh yeah okay. like the butcher block paper so, uh-huh yep yeah. he's got that with him right and he's all dressed up i mean i'm talking like tuxedo like the kids ready to rock and roll so he sets this down and he starts going through this entire presentation right and the presentation's got drawings he's clearly memorized all of these things it's like a shark tank pitch but this is pre shark tank, um, you know, and he's pitching us on why we needed to turn a portion of our campus into something that was essentially like a Disneyland thing. Now, he was a huge Disney fan and he had this entire pitch on how we would do it, how we we're going to raise the money, um, what it was going to be used for, what are the educational benefits to it? I mean, he laid out this whole business plan and I'm like, dude. And one of the things I, cause I talk about it in the first Ted talk I, I gave, I was talking about it a little bit and I'm, I legitimately, I hate Disneyland. I've always hated, I hate Disney. Um, I hate Disneyland. Like I can't stand somewhere for a long time doing nothing to wait in line to go do something that's pretend. I can't, like, I can't do it. Um, God bless you. If you love Disneyland, fantastic. Go enjoy it. Enjoy with your family. Enjoy with your kids. I hate it. Um, and so, but he's, he's laying all this out and I'm like, oh yeah, dude, no, we need to do this. Like we need to do this. This is great. But what it was exemplifying was just the fact that he is a brilliant human. He's an extraordinary communicator. He's a genius. He's a genius. He cannot write an academic essay very well. Who freaking cares? I would hire him. He's got phenomenal character. He's extraordinarily intelligent. He's a brilliant communicator. He's extraordinarily genuine. He's got the biggest heart in the world. He put hours and hours and hours of effort into this thing. Like, why should we not be drawing that out of him? Instead, he went through his entire academic career thinking that he was, quote unquote, special needs because spelling lists were hard. Who freaking cares? We're going to crush his spirit for that. And unfortunately, we're doing that to so many kids. Yeah, it's a travesty. It's just, and and so much of it is also forced to the lowest common denominator. So, you know, those who are excelling in certain areas have to wait around for those who are kind of holding it back. And um, yeah, it's just the one size fits all is completely ludicrous. 
it is ludicrous but even in the military everyone gets a different job for a reason they assess your aptitude and they put you in different jobs based off of your skills and strengths yeah uh why don't we even do that in school you know Um, yep but it's it's that is that's how you funnel as many people as possible through this same system you know and and then it leaves you feeling inadequate so that uh you know you went through the system but you now feel inadequate that you can't teach your own kids so you're going to send them right back through the same system that left you feeling inadequate in the first place right Is that not a religious experience i always liken it to training elephants right where it's like you train the elephant by taking them when they're a small elephant you tie them to the stake where they can't physically pull away so you mentally break them so that even when they're a large elephant you put a little string around their their you know leg and time to a post and they're like guess i'm stuck when all they have to do is go wonk and pull it right well that's what we're doing to our children we've had it done to us in the conveyor belt model but it's so ingrained that stockholm syndrome is so there that we're so in love with our captors that not only do we go ahead and stay there we take our own kids and go we're going to go ahead and tie you up to the post too screw that yeah, man, it's nuts. Uh, so nah, we'll be right uh, back. I gotta go check my kids out of school real quick. <laughs> yeah, we have to end the episode early. Um, <laughs> See you in a minute. That's right. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Y- you said that you know the the father and mother should be the primary educator, and uh, they are. You know, I, and historically, I think that's another thing people don't realize is that was the norm, right? Like your your local little community would have like a schoolhouse, and it was like the parents or like a mother would teach some of the kids, and they would learn. It wasn't only book learning it was like at the time most most people were farmers and things like that so you had to learn life skills to like put food on the table and um you know your value we had a, another guest he talked about don't don't outsource your opportunity to instill your values into your children and yeah. that's like even more true for education right um yeah. because that's going to set them up for the rest of their life so um you know and- just mind-blowing that like you were saying we're just sucked into the system it just keeps going and and i want to make sure again i'm a um i'm i'm annoying with this but i'm annoying with this for for a reason words matter and definitions matter socrates says the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms so i want to define things right so when we say that one room schoolhouse you bet and it was for like an hour a day where they would gather the rest of the time you were out working and getting after on the farm it wasn't an eight hour a day five day a week you know, sort of deal. You get an hour here and there where you're connecting on a couple little things, project based sort of deals. And you yeah, they learned to read and write. That was about and it. it right? and pretty then- much it. And they would do it extraordinarily well. The The literacy rate in our country was at its highest before right before compulsory schooling was invented. Take that in and think about that for a second. We were a, we were a more literate country before compulsory schooling because compulsory schooling has on purpose been designed to teach you how to read as if that was the goal versus learning how to love how to read because that's what will allow you to read and consume to be a better human and you'll love it and you'll go for it do you think you have a lot of people you know guys that are that love reading if you look at the majority of the population most people do hate reading and school teaches you to do that on purpose and the literacy rate has continued to go down and, and be pretty poor since then. Um, so there's there's that schoolhouse part. The other thing I want to make very clear is that um, you said, you know, moms and dads should be the primary educator and, and that's how it always was. No, 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 you are, period. Even if your kids go to school, you're the primary educator in their life, especially for the first developmentally up to about 12 years. Right. And then they start really taking other inputs in quite a bit. That inner voice goes from your voice to all kinds of other inputs. Right. And so we're not unless we're being careful about that, you know, we start to lose a whole lot of influence really, really fast. But you are the primary educator. Brandon, do your kids speak English? Yes. Oh, sweet. How come? What do you speak? You speak English, (laughs) right? right? When they started speaking English before you put them in school, how did you guys, what was the curriculum that you and your wife used to teach them how to speak English before they started school? What was the curriculum you used? Because everybody's going to want to know what that is. The real world. <laughs> oh, crap. You just freaking talk to them and then they learn how to speak. 
Um, what school did you send them to, Brandon, to teach them how to walk? Because you had to send them somewhere. Uh, the shoving them elementary school. <laughs> oh, dear God, yeah, they just freaking did it. Of just, <laughs> yeah. there you go. Dangle they a piece of chocolate. Come on, and that's right. And you maybe you maybe you tempted them, maybe you bribed them. Um, when they fell, you mean they you know they failed at it, right? right? You cheered them on when they started going. When you were talking to them and they started going, oh, no, no, you know, whatever, making noises. You're like, yeah, that's right, right? You cheered on their failures so that mm. they could end up doing what they were going to do in the first place. Yeah. That's how it works. It doesn't magically stop working like that at five years old where it's like, oh crap, now we've got to send them somewhere. Otherwise they're going to be dumb and have a horrible life. No, you just keep going. Now it's like, let's read together and we're going to learn to love reading. All three of my children read extraordinarily well. And hey, by the way, they all love reading and hey by the way i never taught any of them how none of them we just did it together as a family and they loved it and we made it fun and we made it exciting we had great conversations around it and we went on adventures through it and because of that they just started to do it i didn't use a curriculum we used books It's a hard thing for people to wrap their mind around, man. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I, I took a couple nuggets from what you talked about. You know, like even if you're just reading a, a story with them, stop every now and then and ask them. Okay, if you were the main character, what would you do yeah. in that situation? Just little, little things like that. You're just building, you know, critical thinking. Um, I know, yeah. you know, uh, we've talked a lot about the problems. So then, you know, you decided to do something about it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know. What does that look like and, and talk about what you're doing now so people can kind of wake up to the alternatives um yeah i mean i just for my own kids it was it was uh, a conversation of with my wife hey either we're going to home educate or i'm going to start a school of my own that was really the conversation um now one of the biggest mistakes that i made um and i you know i've made many one of the biggest mistakes i ever made was throwing that question out there without defining terms at that point, right? My wife heard home education and I had not done a good job of explaining to her all of the things that I knew school to be and how different I knew school to be from education. In my head, I'm like, okay, I'll keep doing this research. I'll figure this stuff out. I'm gonna do all this and then I'm just gonna go, boom, man, here you go. Here's, here's what's going on. School sucks. Here's what we're doing, right? And that's kind of how I went with it. And she was like, hold on, what? And it was like, I slammed her with so many things all at once, right? And I'm like, and so we're going to homeschool now. And she's like, wait, what? We're doing what? You know, and it was like, I did not do a good job of bringing her along with me. Um, and so, you know, when I first put that out there, I, I was leaning towards wanting to just launch something anyways, because it wasn't just about my kids. I wanted to tell other people and help other people towards this freedom. So you know, she was on board too, but it was for a different reason. It was like, I don't want to homeschool. So I'm like, yeah, let's, let's rock and roll. Right. So, but now she understands what we're talking about. And so now we do, we home educate now. Um, and it's, and it's great. She wouldn't have it any other way. And, and, you know, it's been fantastic, but at that time I'm like, I need to build something. Um, and so I partnered with, uh, this, this, uh, husband and wife out of Texas who had started playing with something they were calling the Acton Academies. Um, I connected with them. I very much love the methodology. I went, okay, I'm going to build, you know, start building one in California. Let's see what happens. Um, and that turned into a wildly successful campus, which turned into two, which turned into three, which turned, you know, turned into me helping them help owners all across the world to launch these things. So, um, you know, as far as alternatives to conveyor belt schooling, um, there are many. Home education is something that everybody can do. Um, People look at it like, well, I've got to bring school home and do subjects and do a, that's not education. I'm not saying bring school home. I'm saying home educate. Those are different things, but everybody can do that. Um, Acton Academies can be great. We are launching a uh, hundred campuses in September of 2024 uh, for Apogee schools. Tim Kennedy and I are, are working on finding out who our partners will be right now uh, to launch those campuses as well. Um, you've got 
you know, some of the Waldorf schools can be great for early ages. Some of the Montessori schools can be great for early ages. There's a ton of options. Um, people just don't understand what the options are and why they would want to choose something different, especially when something is right there and free. Um, but like one of you guys said in the chat a little bit earlier, if, if something's free, you're the product. And that's very much the case. So can you elaborate a yeah, little I bit more? Too I learned on, that like, with Facebook, right? It, uh, what's that? Go for it, Dustin. Oh, sorry. I'm lagging a little bit. Um, yeah, I learned that with Facebook a couple of years ago. You know, our data was being given up. Um, I thought, oh, this is just this nice free service, right? We can just chat with our friends. And then you realize kind of all the downsides to it. And it might makes you think about other things that are free. And why is that free? Maybe it's because I'm the product. And so, you know, some of that's going on, I think, with education, too. It's uh, that, that opened my eyes quite a bit. Yeah, very much so. And so one of the common things, one of the things people will uh, that are listening to this right now, um, some of them are saying, well, no, it's not free. I'm paying for it out of my taxes. So it's it's not free, right? I pay for it out of my property taxes. So it's not actually free. That's one of the things we get quite a bit. Okay, cool. You can make the argument on that. Um, I would argue, do you know that there's a way that you can get out of having to pay property tax? Maybe you should have learned that in school. Um, but that said, since you didn't learn that in school and you are paying property tax, um, great. You're paying for the schools. If property taxes went to making sure that my child got three square meals of McDonald's every single day, I wouldn't do it. If I had to pay extra money to go get real food, I'd be like, well, that's cool that it pays for McDonald's, but I'm not down with giving them three meals at McDonald's a day for the rest of it. Like, I just, I don't want to do that to my kids, man. I will make the extra effort to figure out how to make sure I can pay for food so they can get nourished, you know, the way they need to nourish, get nourished. Um, that's the way I look at the whole property tax argument. It's the same thing. Cool, man. Congrats. You're already paying for it. So it sucks. So we might as well, since this sucks, I might as well make my kid's life suck too. Like wh what? I don't see the logic there. Yeah. So my, to give you a little heads up, my wife is actually uh, a second grade school teacher and she's got a master's. She's got like six different certifications. Yep. Uh, she's been working on her national board certification this year. And it's like our conversation I mean, we've had these conversations like, do we do we homeschool? How do we how do we get because my son struggled in public school? You know, there's like you said, there's these framed times of when he's supposed to be reading by and when mm -hmm. he's supposed to be doing this or he has to repeat and he has to do so, so well on a certain standardized test. And it's like it's just teaching my kid that if he doesn't keep up with whatever the status quo is for that specific school, he's a failure. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to build him up to the exact opposite, you know? And so it's like with both of us working, it's really tough for us to figure out how to do that. So maybe you could uh, shed some light on that for me, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah it's, absolutely. So, and, you know, first of all, kudos to your wife. Um, truly, I am on the side of people who are good humans in this system. And by the way, this system's not going away it's not going anywhere. So I want good people in that system because right. for some of these young heroes, they're never going to meet better people, better adults than they do when they go to these schools. I, I know that. So I want that, you know, I want good people there, man, for sure. So, um, you know, there's that, but when, when people are looking at, at bringing somebody home and, and, you know, we've been again, grow up in this religion and this cult. So we've now got two parents working out of the house. And we're like, Oof. So I always say it's got to have, you got to have a couple conversations. One, um, is there anything that we can downsize? Hmm. That's a real conversation. Like there's a lot of people that I've, that I've met. And again, this isn't going to be the blanket answer for everybody, but I have met a lot of couples who are like, look, man, we just can't, there's no way we both have to work to, uh, you know, to pay the bills and they've got a 4,000 square foot you know, home and they've got seven cars and they've got, you know, the, the memberships to all of these things. And they've got a specific closed budget every month that could pay for a private school. And they've got, you know, so it's like, okay, do, is there something there? And, and if, and if you're like, yeah, but well then cool, you see where your priorities are like that plain and simple. Um, yeah, I don't know how else to, to break it to you. So, you know, there's that, um, there are ways to, look at, you know, making more money. There's ways to, uh, to look, I mean, we went 
I went at one point, went from a six figure position down to a $31,000 a year job. When my wife, we we're in, in, in California, um, with my wife having a baby, uh, and we were like, Nope, we're going to go ahead and make stuff work to stay at home. So like, we're going to cut everything that we can cut. You're going to stay home here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to make extra money on the side. And I'm going to start building out some other sort of business over here, you know, to do what we can do. Right. It was about the sacrifice for us. Yeah. Um, but even if you've got to both stay working, okay, cool. Well, let's say you guys are both working. Um, but you've got, you know, you've got George and his wife down the street. And they both work too, but George is off on Mondays and Tuesdays. His wife's on, off on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, you know, maybe Dustin's wife uh, is off on Fridays. Maybe Dustin's off on third. So you can find people too, if there's enough people that are interested in this and you can start working with schedules where as long as somebody is there to make sure your young ones are covered and there's an adult there, right? Maybe that they can, maybe you can roll that way. Um, because what you don't have to do is recreate school. You've got to redefine in your mind what education means and make sure somebody has them covered. And then worst case scenario, maybe both of you still have to work and they just, you pay somebody to watch them during the day and you work on the education components at night and on the weekends. That's doable too, right? So we will find excuses as to why we can't versus reasons as you know, to why we have to. And that's the problem. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, that's such a great point is, you know, be a problem solver, not a woe is me, you know, don't, don't, don't look what at the problems, is, find the solutions, find the solution. One of our rules in our house is no complaining, fix it. If it is worth saying, Oh, this should, or we should uh, find the solution. Do Otherwise yeah. don't talk about it. That's good. Can you go into a little bit more detail about the differences between, you know, like the Acton Academy, Apogee program versus, you know, the conveyor belt system? Yeah, um, glad to. So conveyor belt system, you know, says everybody, same thing, same time. You're just with the, um, you know, people that your same date of manufacture, right? I'm, I'm 43, so I better all, are you guys all 43? Because if we're not, we shouldn't be talking if we're not all 43, right? George, how old are you? You're Almost. Clearly, close 34 you're 34 so george i automatically get to look down on you okay. right you need to look up to me i get to look down on you because i'm older um right and that's the way it works because that's how school <laughs> shows us right but we can't be talking because we're not both 43 um so but that also means george because i'm 43 and you're 34 then i should be smarter than you i should be more successful than you i should make more money than you i should make because hey i'm 40 i'm older i'm ahead right and if i'm not and if I'm not making the same amount of money as the other 43 year olds, am I at 43 year old level, right? Or whatever that is, right? So school assumes these grade levels and these various, you know, stepping stones to layer right. in all of this other academia, because that's what's on the pedestal is academia and academic success, right? We're playing the game of life, not the game of school. So we want to look at things that actually matter and transfer into the real world. How do we make a microcosm of society here. How do they learn how to engage with other people? How do they get rules of engagement around what a good conversation looks like? So I understand how to articulate my point of view on something. I understand how to genuinely listen to somebody else's point of view. We can actually have a conversation around it. We can maybe even agree to disagree. And we're all emotionally safe to do that, right? So we want to do that through great rules of engagement, through Socratic conversations. We want to learn to think and make decisions. So we want them to have Socratic conversations on a daily basis. We want things to be project based. We want them to actually have to go try to produce something, create something, um, you know, do something together that translates again into the real world and get feedback from the real world, not look at an arbitrary list or a grade. So let's go start a business. And let's see, do we make money? Do we not make money? Did somebody over there start a business that looked just like mine, but they made more money? Why? What was it? Was it their articulation of it? Was it their marketing? What, right? We want them to tackle projects like that. We want them to have real responsibility around campus where they're learning to run the day-to-day -day campus. They're learning to help people that are younger than them. They're working and collaborating with people that are older. They're responsible for something on campus that becomes their job. Um, I mean, I had a chef on one of my campuses who was 17. He was the head chef. He made the food every single day. He hired middle schoolers that had to come interview 
with him to get the sous chef positions and they would make real food every day that the parents would order they'd have to cook it and get it at 11 30 man we've got 72 orders we got to get out let's go they ran the kitchen right we want them involved in internships we want them involved in apprenticeships we want them doing real work that matters so the campus has become microcosms of that and all tim and i are doing on the apogee side is we're adding a couple of things that Acton we thought was missing. I love Acton. No, um, I, I still help as many owners. Like I've got nothing bad to say. The phenomenal humans, phenomenal stuff. Um, there's not enough, enough emphasis on the physical fitness side. We think that's a non-negotiable for young people. So we want that, that part in there. And there's not any emphasis on making sure parents are growing too. And that to me is a non-negotiable. If Dustin is telling his kids all day long, you can be everything you want to be and you should be in good shape and good health. And, and man, you should have great relationships and like, dude, you should be excited about your life and you, but they also hear Dustin go, oh, I'm so fat. I'm out of shape. Oh, I don't make any money. I hate my life. Ah, oh, it's Monday. I don't want to go into work. I don't want, that's called hypocrisy. And they pick that up and they don't trust you and they don't believe what you're saying. And so they don't own that themselves, right? So we want parental growth. Yeah, lead by uh, example. Lead by example. So we're going to make sure our parents are walking, you know, through these through these programs of growth as well. So um, it when you say what's different, everything's different. All of it. So how do we, uh, you know, how do people get plugged in, or how do, you know how how does that process even work? Or uh, uh, you know whether whether you find one that's getting stood up in your area or you want to yeah. set one up, what, what's that look like? Cause I'm so, yeah, I mean, I, I even think I'm like, man, that sounds really daunting. It um, is. Yeah, it is. It's a hard thing. I mean, it's a hard thing to run. Right. But Tim and I are going, you know, we, we will never uh, sugarcoat the fact that it is a hard business, but it can also be something that is extraordinarily um, not just worthwhile from a mission standpoint, but it's something that you can replace your income to currently if you need to and want to do that. Right. There's ways to do that. So, um, we're in the, right now we're in the step one phase of, of auditions. So we're really looking for the partners. We're like, who are our hundred partners on this? So we've got applications coming in, um, really for the next few weeks for this first round, because we want to get our partners dialed in so that November, December, meaning the people who are going to run the programs the who are going to be, it's going to be there. They're going to be an affiliate, right? Think of it like a CrossFit gym. Okay. Right. So you, you can start you're going to kind of give the, yeah, it's your business. But you don't own CrossFit altogether, but it's your business and you can build that out and you've got a network that's working together and then we can all collaborate together. We're doing the same thing with the schools. Right. And so within that, Tim and I will help also on not just the training on how to do it and do it well in your community, but we also have the ability to go jump on Fox and go get on Rogan and go get on Jocko's and go get like let people know what's going on and point people to here's where our locations are. Um, and we're not as concerned about the locations as we are the humans. We got to have good people on our team. So it's humans first and wherever they happen to be located. And then, and then here we go. And like, let's start, let's start building the momentum that way. We'll need to talk after. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you can done. email me directly. If they're interested in finding out some more info, you can email me or email fed. Fed is our, uh, our rock star assistant for Tim and I fed at apogeestrong.com F E D at apogeestrong.com. He'll send you all the, background info videos and and um you know if you're interested in in applying um he'll give you the link on that too that's awesome so, so one then, of the sorry go, go ahead, ahead no i was gonna say um one of the uh programs was the strong dads program and it, it looked like it was a 12-month program is that still the case and and how is it different so we got different fingers same hand right so we've got our campuses that we're launching and those are the k through 12 campuses young men young women um and K through 12, full on real education, not school, right? So you got this over here. You've got um, the young men's program, which is specifically a mentorship program. It is 12 months of projects, challenges, readings, workouts, um, daily interactions in a private platform. And then you're getting to interact every single week with the best of the best of the best. So Kumulatos, you know, he comes on as a mentor. Nick Bear comes on as a mentor. Andy Frazella comes on as a mentor. Obviously, Tim Kennedy comes on as a mentor. Ray Care comes on. I mean, John Lovell, you know, I don't you name it, man. Just phenomenal humans continuously coming in. Right. And so these young men are building out this digital portfolio of work that can then open up opportunities for them for 
work or for college or you know whatever they want to whatever they want to go afterwards right so you got that the dad's program the men's program is essentially the same thing as that yes 12 months projects challenges related to very specific themes i was talking about the 1041 tax system earlier nobody talks about that well we're showing these guys how to do it we're, to we're showing them how to pour in and level up as a husband and level up as a father and it's not just Matt and Tim are like, this is how you do it because this is how we do it. No, we have gone to the best of the best of the best. Like when we're talking about sales and marketing, cool. Well, Alex Hormozy came in as a mentor and he is helping us on the sales and marketing curriculum for these guys to tackle because he's phenomenal at it. So why would he not, right? Nick Bear's coming in and helping on, Jason Kalipa's helping on the physical fitness side because they know that world, right? So mike glover and fieldcraft survival helping us on the the resilience and self you know self-reliance piece of it like we're we're tapping into all these ninjas to help people continue to grow so you got the dads there we're going to launch our women's program same sort of thing um and our young ladies as well so again reseeding free society by redefining education for the entire family and then we have our home education program we got about 200 220 ish families from across the world who are home educating and we are providing them with resources and and interaction and, and uh, weekly q a calls and all of that as well to show them how to do it that's fair. yeah personal yeah kalipa this makes oh, so much yeah. sense kalipa is one of my i mean he is one of my i just literally was talking to him right before i jumped on this podcast with you guys <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Jason, Jason's a rock star. So Jason's going to help us build out the physical fitness programming for all of the Apogee schools. Kalipa's a, a great human, man. He's rad. He's he's phenomenal. I love that, man. I, it's just to me, it's so common sense, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, let's go have the best people, the masters of each craft, teach, teach our kids. Know. What, a, what an idea, you know? Hey, what an idea. And then when yeah. they find the thing that they think is like, ooh, this is the coolest thing, or this is the thing I'm really the best at, or I, or I love, then great. Let's lean into that and let's get even better. It is, it's common sense. Yeah. Do you, um, do you tailor kind of the program differently for boys and girls? Is there a, or is it homogenous? Is, or yeah. is it just based off of what each kid kind of excels at or, you know? Oh. Yes, yes, and yes, right? So the mentorship okay. program is very specific to, you know, boys. And then as we get our girls program, that'll be very specific to girls. Those mentorship programs are also woven into the K-12 so that there are times when they're all together and collaborating, but then there's also times when they're separated to dive into like the young men's side of things. And it's not like young men's side of things like, hey, sex ed, here's why you're a walking boner at 13, right? Like it's not... It's not, that's not what we're there for. It's to dive into those like, hey, here's a good man. And right. this is what a good man looks like. And let's make sure you are opening doors and saying, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And do it right. Let's make sure those things are dialed. Like that's what it's talking about. Yeah. Teaching true masculinity. I you know, love that. From character. Age. Character. Yeah. Real character. Character. Yeah. character. Values. Integrity. Well, I mean, and honor. just... At the risk of being offensive, uh, don't care. Boys are different than girls, and they learn a lot differently. I sure was, you know. Um, I, I got in trouble a lot. It's I, I was a great student on paper academically, right. but in my elementary years, man, I was at. So I went to private school. It was a small private school. Uh, you know, you'd if you were like getting in trouble, you'd have to stay late after school and sweep rocks on the playground yeah. and push it like the the pea gravel back into the playground every freaking day, man. I was there. For like years you know yeah. and i'm sure my parents are like oh my gosh he's always in trouble but had straight a's you know <laughs> so right. it's like i i was a uh, yeah i needed to be outside running around and breaking my legs and stuff you know and uh all young sitting men. in the class was not good for me it's not good for anybody it's not it goes against human development it's not good for anybody. We're not supposed to be sitting down under fluorescent lights at that young of an age, sitting there sedentary, listening to something that would bore the hell out of anybody, child or adult, um, that they don't care about. Like it's, it is not. I mean, I just think thing. about like your office job, even you get up and take a break every now and then, right? And walk around or, you know, go outside for some air. Like I, I probably have more free time in my professional job than I ever had in school. Well, <laughs> you but you still. Mean? 
So but when you're at work, George, do you still raise your hand and make sure that you ask somebody else's permission to go to the bathroom? Because you should. I actually have to do that being in the operating room. <laughs> so that is still fair. All to call right. <laughs> actually. <laughs> actually. Awesome. I'm going to dub this now with that guy to so pop up on your face right learned. there. But. Oh, that's that's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Congratulations. Yeah. That so that's a great yeah. skill I learned for the system. So when, yeah. when lives aren't at yeah. stake, <laughs> yes. You know, right. nope, just get up and do it. Oh, <laughs> so funny, man. Yeah. Nope. Thanks, Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm here to help. Yeah. I think you so, had a Matt, serious question. So please. Building, yeah. I love how you're building kind of a cadre of personalities, right? Because there are so many advantages you get by going to a Stanford, by going to a Chapel Hill, you know, to a well-known university. Um, and it's funny, we don't even talk about what our, uh, what our degrees were in, right? You don't tell someone, I, I got a psychology degree from Chapel Hill. I just say I went to, you know, Stanford because nobody cares because it's all about the clout and the name, which clearly says that that's what it's about. It's about who you know and, and those connections. So by giving that up and saying, all right, I'm not going to go to the um, the high powered uh, private high school, you know, that would set me up to go to the high powered college. You have to have an alternate system of powerful people who are well connected. And so I think for a lot of people jumping into kind of a homeschool environment where you don't have those connections, you do potentially harm your future, not because you're not learning as much, but because you're not as well connected. So the fact that you guys are doing this with these incredible connections creates a really legitimate alternative option that, that's exciting well and i and i would and i would push back too and say look if, if what we're just acknowledging which i would agree with you 100 percent, is that these quote unquote ivy league schools the myth of the elite school i can tell you stanford and brown and princeton and yale are no better than wherever you went state um they're very rarely are they better by any large degree whatsoever right it just has this brand associated with it but and sometimes there is a networking ability we now live in a time where you can you can network even if you're not a part of this program you can network and build a network better faster stronger than you ever were able to if you have the desire to do it um so you can build that network and build that connection but here's what else that also highlights then well maybe if you don't have the network you've got to build out this alternative thing called skills maybe you build out a skill set where you're really good at something. Oh, hang on. That, that sounds like personal too. responsibility. I don't And that's the problem. And that's the problem is because That sounds too hard. Yeah. That sounds too hard. It's someone it's else's fault though. They they set me up for failure. And guys, that we're talking about the human condition, man. That's the hardest part of all of this is that it's always easier to outsource everything because then you can at least point the finger when things don't go right. It's always easier to do that. I'd be really interested to see what, you know, uh, we, previous guest, John Michael is his name. Uh, you know, he, he's real big on men taking responsibility. You have the authority to lead your family, but you take responsibility for the outcomes too. And, that, you know, mm -hmm. what you were just saying right there, I think is systemically men not taking responsibility for generations now. And here, here we are, right? And uh, it's totally it'd be interesting are. to put you guys together and see, you know, kind of rattle off back and forth about some of that. I mean, personally, I think it boils down to, to one specific thing is that, that, and I teach this to my son all the time. You are either interested in something or you are committed to it. And what you have to do before you do anything is you have to count the cost. What is the real cost of you investing all of your time and your commitment into something? And then mm -hmm. there's also another side of that coin, which is if you're seeing what, what, what the cost is for committing, what's the cost if you don't? Mm -hmm. And so I, I have to have him go through that exercise. And a lot of men are not doing that. And, and it's because, like you said, the conveyor belt teaches them not to. They're not doing it for themselves, never mind for their own kids. They're not doing it for any I mean, 100%. And there's two things. I want. So one, going back really quickly to the to the college part, to the access, you know, the um, to the networks and all this kind of stuff. Talking about access, if you have internet, connection and you have a library card you have access to pretty much all information of all time you have it colleges used to be the gateway for it right there used to be a gateway or a gatekeeper and schools could be a little bit of a gatekeeper they're no longer the thing man and by the way you can actually take a whole bunch of university courses from all these campuses for free I mean, so information's there, 
it's the desire that we're lacking it's the self-responsibility that we're lacking like those are the things that are lacking for most people it's not access to information it's desire because we're trained to lose the desire or we're distracted right because we're gonna you know spend hours a day scrolling or hours a day on a video game and hours this so we're distracted and we're not pursuing you know as well so that's one thing and then i like that you use the word committed um, and I want to define that again, too. Here's that annoying definition guy is one of the words commitment gets bastardized right now, too. And I'll tell you where it gets bastardized a lot. It's actually in the church. Hey, if anybody's ready to recommit your life to Christ right right now, let's go recommit your life. Hey, guess what? If you have to recommit, you weren't committed. Exactly. You weren't committed. Yep. Right. Should I tell my wife I am going to recommit to you every week? I will recommit to you because. I was faithful to you Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday. That chick was hot, right? Like you're not committed then. You're not committed. 100%. So we have to define that word. Commitment requires some sort of covenant that you don't negotiate with. We negotiate far too much with everything, with our own integrity, with our own character, with our own values, with our own parenting. We negotiate so much that we don't commit to our families that we will take the responsibility for it. We go, now we're going to outsource this here and we're going to outsource this here. I can't do it. man. Yeah. It, it's a problem that just perpetuates itself too. Mm -hmm. Dustin, I think you had a, something you want to jump in with, right? Yeah. Going all in is scary, right? And, you know, committing fully means that you can't keep those options open. And so that, that's a tough thing. So I've noticed, uh, you know, in my anesthesia school specifically, there were, I think, 25 women and five men in the class. Um, mm. We're seeing women absolutely crushing men in college, high school scores, all of that. All of the lawyers, doctors, um, you know, our quote unquote uh, top professions that we go for. Um, women are absolutely destroying men. And do you think that has something to do with the educational system? And I, I'd be curious with your take of why we're starting to see that trend occurring. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good that's a really good point. Um, I, I would tend to think that there is likely um, the, the way that school is set up. It's not set up for human development. But that said, it is more closely related to the female brain than it is the male brain. It is structured in a way that does um, come closer to rewarding how girls would, you know, be fine learning and, and going after some things anyway. So it is already set up that way. Um, and then, you know, slowly but surely, and one of the things people don't like to hear um, and they get mad about this and they're like, oh, you're a conspiracy, this or that, which is fine. But the Communist Party took over our teachers unions in the 50s. Like they just did it. it they took it over before we were all in school. Um, I mean, and what we're seeing right now is like the it's the cultural revolution that happened oh, under Mao. I mean, it's like almost. The only thing that hasn't happened yet is throwing teachers off of buildings, but pretty I mean, much everything else up to that there, point. There's like, and there's, we've quite literally are like, we've just learned, like people just learned this week that there's still like seven districts in the country that are being funded by China for these Confucius schools, right? That are all over the US. And it's like, but what happens every time these things come out, the sexualization of children, the drag queens coming in and reading for story time, um, you know, the, the sex ed stuff getting off the hook, like all... What happens every time that happens is somebody comes back to me from like 10 or 15 years ago when I started telling people about this and they're like, oh, you said this was going to happen. I'm like, yeah, I'm not Nostradamus. I'm just telling you what I already know because I cared enough to look and pay attention. Right. Yeah. So all of the warning these signs were there. It's all there. It's not even warning signs. They've been very vocal about the agenda. People well, just now they are. Yeah. Listen. <laughs> so people don't want to pay attention. Right. And they think that a, a protest is going to help. Right. So. Um, so all of these things have been out there, including continuing not only just the system already ready more for girls than it is for boys, but you also start to continue to vilify the young men and get them on medication and things like that early and often. And so we're systematically attacking the young men more and more and more, too, which is just going to make less and less and less young men want to stay within that system or do well or show themselves right so that that is a big that is a big part of it is, is weakening that and then you've got some of your levels of your games too like you know meritocracy of getting into some of these schools everybody thinks get good grades and do some extracurriculars right and you're going to get into all of these schools 
Well, there's also the other game of sometimes they're being told we need to have 65% of our uh, applications that we accept have to be female. This year, 35% can be men. Like that's it. If we're taking X amount, 65% have to be women. Like there, there's these conversations actually take place too. Um, and so, you know, there's, it's a multifaceted thing, but it doesn't surprise me. We're seeing more and more women rocking that. And which is again, women are brilliant human beings. There's not, it's not a, it's not a women or versus guys or what, like none of that should be of this versus this at all. Um, we just shouldn't even be talking about this. It should just be the meritocracy. We're all told it is because we're in a system that we're all told gets us ready for life. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, life isn't always a meritocracy either. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> we talked about the networking and connections, you know, like, um, that helps a lot. It helps to know people. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Uh, you know, another thing that just really excites me about what you and like Tim are working on and bringing in all these, especially for the young men the, and the boys, um, is to have all these really positive male role models come in from all these different fields. And I, you know, I just reflect back on my own experience. Almost all my teachers were women. Yeah. Um, and in many ways, I think I was lacking as a young man, not, not because they were bad teachers, right. um, but because there's just certain things that only men can draw out of boys to turn into men. Right. And yeah. a lot of that is rolling around in mud and dirt and, you know, violence. <laughs> um, thankfully I did sports like wrestling and Taekwondo where, you know, you can get pretty hurt and yeah. stuff, but for, you know, for a lot of young boys, you never have any of that experience. Yeah. I, I mean, it's also no wonder why, there's so many issues, but why do you have any idea why, you know, so many teachers are women? Is it just because the nur the desire to nurture and, or is it a bigger yeah, issue? I, mean, I don't, I don't know. It really is. And it's the nature of teaching in general, right? It is more of a nurturing thing. What does it think about what teaching is? It's a lot of it is face to face. It is the person standing up here and they are, you know, giving this, right? It's the face to face thing. It is how women are designed. And again, that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Women can teach other girls and women things that men can't teach them and vice versa. It's just the nature of the beast. So, but that whole system is, is this, right? It's the face to face. I'm standing up here. You're over here and I'm going to talk at you over here and, and then I'm going to nurture you and I'm going to like, that's what the whole system is. Men don't operate as much like this. Men operate like this. We go side to side, right? We're not face to face as much. We go side to side to go, conquer, yeah. to go conquer something together, to go tackle something together, to go take on a, a, a common enemy, right? Or to go mm -hmm. take on that. That's how men operate, whereas women want to talk through it more. That's one of my biggest problems with therapy as we do it for men. I'm not knocking therapy or men who take therapy. What I'm knocking is the therapists who say, let's just talk it out versus giving them a plan of action because men – like the way we're designed. And again, this is the beauty of the design. Women are more able to um, talk their way or, or, or think their, um, how do I want to say this? They're able to think their way into a new way of acting. Men are designed to act their way into a new way of thinking, right? We have to act first. And that's what's going to allow us yeah. to get the knowledge and the wisdom. And so we do that as a side by side, let's go tackle together. And school does not do that very often. So, so it makes sense that we've got more women that gravitate towards it and more women that do well in it. So I'm unable to just sit and meditate, right? It doesn't work for me, but if I'm moving through a flow, I'm allowed, right. my mind starts to expand in a totally different way. It's, it's right. I, I never thought about it that way. That's so interesting. And that's how our brains are designed. Yeah. yeah I do works. some of my best thinking mowing the lawn. Sure. <laughs> Truly. I listen to an audio book and I just, my, I just go off into these deep thoughts. I'm like, man. Truly. I didn't and know I had it in me. Truly. <laughs> and that is how men are designed. We're designed to take action first. And in the process of that, we, we get these insights and we learn. And then when we can partner with another brother and we're doing something together, we bond that way. We don't even have to be speaking. We're bonding through that shared struggle, right? And through that shared, it's how we're designed, man. So shouldn't our upbringing 
take advantage of that versus squash it, eliminate it, say it's wrong. And it probably means you have a methamphetamine deficiency that we have to get you on when you're five. Like, of what? course. <laughs> what? Right? Yeah. So. It couldn't be that you're sitting at a desk for eight hours straight. Uh, no, it has nothing to do with under, under fluorescent lights being told that the sun's killing everybody. Give me a freaking break. <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah. You know, what did, what did people do a hundred years ago before, you know, sunblock and stuff? Mm. Crazy. They must have all died. Uh, yes. Skin cancer was the number one killer of humans for all of, all of time until now, I guess. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Stupid logic. Brandon, I think you had some questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, kind of shifting gears a little bit and heading into just your personal journey as a father. Um, what are some things that you find that are just vitally important to teach your children just on, in your own personal life? What are the things that are important to teach them? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you uh, like to educate them? Like, you know, yeah, it's a, that's a really, it's a really good question. Um, so first and foremost, for any parent, what I always tell them is, again, I go back to the, we we're talking about how we're the, um, the number one educator for our children. Right. So leading by example, is a non-negotiable. Absolutely. Right. That's first and foremost for every parent. Um, you want to tell them you can be anything you want to be, but you're not going and pursuing something. You're a liar. You want to tell them, I want you to be healthy. I want you to be, but you're sitting there drinking your beers and, you know, pounding your, your Doritos or whatever it is. You're a liar. Um, you're a hypocrite. Right. And so they're going to see that don't lie. And then they're like, but don't tell your mom this. Well, come on, dude. Right. You're, you're a hypocrite. You're a liar. So not being hypocritical, leading by example, you being on a mission of growth is non-negotiable, right? So that's first and foremost. And then what we need to remember is we don't actually have to do anything to our kids. We do something to the environment to make sure it's right for our kids to grow, right? And I always use the example of a garden and I've started using that because where I am now on this farm, I can see, you know, part of our garden out this window over here. Then what I always say is like, we have the seed, you plant the seed. You don't have to go do something to the seed. You don't go yell at the seed. You don't go beat it. Like you don't have to do anything to the seed. You have to control the environment. You want to make sure it gets the right amount of sun. You want to make sure it's next to the right plants that aren't going to kill it, that are going to help, help it continue to grow. You want to make sure the soil's good. You want to make sure it gets enough water, but not too much water. And then it's going to grow. It's going to do what it needs to do. Right. So that's our job as a parent is to make sure the environment's right. So I'm leading by example first, and then I'm going to really control the environment. Again, for those first developmental years, again, their, their inner voice is my voice. So how do I control that inner voice? How do I make that a positive, optimistic, resilient inner voice? Part of that is through giving positive affirmations when tied to the actions that you want to see. If you give young heroes affirmations, but they're not tied to anything else, it actually goes the other way. It causes depression. It doesn't cause them to be excited. So this whole self-esteem generation of just like, you're the best no matter what. Like, it's great you got eighth place, but you should get a big trophy too. Like, that's actually crushing them. It actually causes depression. So tie the positive feedback to the things you want to see. When my son opens the door for his sisters, for his mom, for people, for strangers at the store, I praise it every time, inspirationally, the things that I want to see. When I have to correct them, and of course I do have to correct them sometimes, when I have to correct them, I correct them calmly. I don't lose my stuff and I tie it back to what the behavior was and what the action was and what the action could have been, should have been. And, and I just, you know, raise the bar of the expectation that it's going to happen the next time. And I do those things every single time. People ask, how do you discipline kids? You don't, you teach them to be disciplined humans and that's how you do it through inspiring them when they do something well and through calmly correcting when they don't, but you're consistently leading by example. Everything in this house is a, we do. It's not a, you do and you do and you do and I do it's no, no, this is a, we do Bodro men open the doors for women, period. You're a Bodro man. It's just what we do. Bodro men and women don't complain unless we have a solution. It's just who we are. It's what we do, right? So we have those conversations as a family. That's how we're making sure. And then we start diving into the, 
minutia of what they get excited about and what they want to do. But again, I'm going to control the environment and all those things. Part of the environment is what are they listening to? What are they watching? Who are they being influenced by? My father does not get to talk to my children. I don't personally have anything against him. He was a hard man to grow up with. I wish him nothing but the best. I love him. He's not somebody that I want to influence my kids. That's a hard decision to have to make, but he doesn't get the chance to influence them because it wouldn't be a positive one. There are some things there that I know he would do that are not okay. He wouldn't physically harm them. He would be very sweet to them all the time, but they would see things that I don't believe good men do. Mm. Therefore, he doesn't get to influence, right? So I'm thinking about that from the environmental standpoint. All right. Yeah. So what I'm talking about educating my kids, I'm not like, you got to teach them math at this point. No, I'm talking about this is how we look at the world. And then as we continue to live, because this is what we do as a family, I'm going to bring you along. The fact that we operate in the 1041 system, my children will talk to you about that at 12, 10 and 7. Most adults can't because they don't know it exists. Mine do because we're doing that as a family and I just show them what we're doing. It's not hard. It's actually very simple. People just don't, they want to do something to the kid. That was a lot more than you asked for, probably. It was great, man. I love it. Matt, do you mind sharing some specific examples of the kinds of behaviors that you're concerned about, someone like your dad or, or other people that, because I'm, I'm really interested in something specific that you are worried about protecting your kids from. That, that was really interesting. Um, so my father was a hard man to grow up with. Again, I, I truly, I don't want to paint. He did a lot of things well too, but he did a lot of things that were extraordinarily not okay. Um, and, and, and a very abusive physically, emotionally, you know, all of those kind of things. Right. And I, and as I've grown, I understand he's battling his own demons. I, I get that. I get that as a man. Now I understand what he was battling and fighting. And I see that he lived his, his life in fear. And, um, that's unfortunate, you know, for him. Right. And I, I so that that's fine um he's also extraordinarily manipulative um and if he's got a beef against somebody and he's got many beefs against a lot of people in our family who are actually really good humans um he is extraordinarily one of the most intelligent people that i know and he's very very manipulative um and so he works very hard to undermine and manipulate people into getting on his side to go against other humans you know particularly in our family and um, they've got a very good relationship with my brother. My brother is my best friend in the entire world, um, you know, outside of my wife and wife and kids. Um, and he's a really, really good man. And my dad and him have a beef. And I know he will. He tries to get the entire family to go against my brother. Like, it's just those manipulative things that I'm like, hey, man, until I see evidence that this is stopping. And by the way, you're almost 70 and it hasn't stopped yet. So, hey, um, you just don't get to. So it's it's stuff like that. Like, it's the character components. Right. I want good care i want people of good character i know enough good people i can connect with enough good people i want people with solid character and morals and values that are goal driven that are purpose driven that are service driven that are going to teach other people you know i like i want as much of that as possible while they're still under my control i can't control it forever and i don't want to i'm not trying to it's not a it's not a sheltering it's an intentionally building a strong foundation People are always like, oh, dude, you're trying to shelter them, right? They've got to go to school. So they realize some people suck. That's the dumbest freaking thing I've ever heard. If all of us are like, hey, man, we've got to get better. I want to get better as a human. Do you go like, oh, I should probably go spend a week in prison so that I can see that there's shitty people out there. And like, that's how that's yeah. stupid. No, you go work with people who are operating at a higher level so that you can raise your game. Yeah. And well, and they won't tolerate you being subpar, right? They, they demand that you rise to the occasion. So while my kids are in these developmental stages where yeah. I you want to normalize that, yeah. I want to normalize greatness and character and resilience and self-confidence and self-awareness. I want to normalize those things so that when they start going out way more where they're not being influenced by me, my 12 year old is now working, you know, at jobs and she has all the, she has two jobs at 12, right? So she's around other people, but she is normalized 
these things. And when she sees people going against that, it's like, hey, man, that's unfortunate. You know, it's too bad. And I'm going to see if I can help this person get past this and go through. She acts like an adult or what you would want an adult to act like because that's normal for her now. That's baseline. Awesome. Yeah, thanks yeah, for explaining you wanna that. Raise, you yeah. want to raise good adults, not make them really good at being a kid, you know? <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. That, that's, they're not, yeah, we forget that they're people. It's like, they're practicing to be people. No, they're people with less practice. So they're people. So Matt, can you give an example of, it sounds almost like you were describing po uh, toxic positivity. Can you give an example where you're positive with your child, but it actually harms them, as you mentioned, um, and gives the opposite effect? Anytime, you know, there's uh, there was this big affirmation movement, you know, that really happened in the 90s and early 2000s, where it's like you stand in the mirror and you're like, you're a good person. And everybody thought, yeah, right. Like uh, that was yeah, a like lot of unconditional positive. I'm a special regard, snowflake. Yeah. Positive, <laughs> yes, man, for sure. Where it's like, and so a lot of people will do that with their kids too and just praise everything. Like, oh my gosh. And they'll do it with grades, especially, right? It's like, oh my God, you're so smart. You know, and, and the kid, if they know that they don't actually have something to connect it to, subconsciously it starts to actually decrease the self-actualization part, the part of them that starts to develop self-confidence because they're not connecting it to something. Grades included, they're like, I got straight A's, me personally. I got straight A's all throughout school. I didn't try. So somebody telling me that I was really smart because I got good grades, I'm like, I don't think so, man. I just know how to play this game. Like, it's not that hard. And this isn't, I don't feel extraordinarily intelligent. Like, it didn't really, but we do that so many places where we're like, oh my God, you're the best. Like, oh, I saw you out there playing basketball. Dude, you're the best. And if the kid's like, actually, everybody else on this team is better than me, that kid was yeah. better than me, whatever. Like, we're connecting these things that aren't true and they know it consciously or subconsciously. So you praise the work ethic, you praise the behaviors that you want to see. And again, when there's something there that you, that you want to see change, you just calmly like, Hey man, this is what we do. And I'm going to give you the example of this, right? But that anytime you're praising those behaviors or just arbitrarily like you're the best, you're the most amazing human, you're the most whatever, right? You're just, but you're not tying it to a specific action or behavior that they can go, okay, why? Why is that, that I'm the best? If they can't tie it to something, it actually psychologically starts to go the other direction. I am so guilty of doing that with my son. Thankfully, he's only three. I'm gonna, I'm gonna correct that so many action. People are. So many people are. So it's not that you don't stay positive, because you do, but it's when he falls down and then gets right back up. And you're like, oh man, that was brave right there. You fell down. I knew that. I know that hurt. Um, but you just got up right there. And that's, that was pretty strong, right? Like that was, that was a brave thing you did. And that was a tough thing you did, man. That was, that was awesome. Way to go. You know, like you're tying it to something so we can see, oh, okay. I fall down. I got back up and I didn't, you know, I, I would push through and that was kind of tough. Like you just, you give them the thing to connect it to, man. Makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> and just to drive the point home, <clears throat> excuse me is uh that like you said you know if they are doing the wrong thing or they're not doing their best or whatever you didn't attack them and it's not punishment it's hey this is what we do what we expect in this family and it's it's That's more right. of a it's a it's a calling for it's them to, to rise as opposed to yeah right and so the way you make that powerful is again you don't you you make sure that you correct them each time. Like you have that standard. You make sure they know what exactly what the standard is. You make sure everybody's living it. And then you correct them calmly when that's there. You let them know responsibilities come before the freedom, right? So like the freedoms, the things that you want to do, those don't happen until the responsibilities are taken care of. You're outside playing and having a good time. That's awesome. What's the rule on the Legos in your room? Those need to be picked up before I before I go outside. Cool, man. Are all the Legos picked up? Mm -mm. So what do you need to do? I need to go pick those up. That's right. How come? Because we take care of our responsibilities before we take you know before we get to enjoy our freedoms. Cool, man. Sounds good. It sounds like you already got it nailed. So go for it, right? And they go do that. Now here's where it really gets powerful and where they really believe you. If you start saying the we do, we do, we do, and they catch you not doing whatever the we do is, they need to be given the permission to calmly and um you know respectfully call you out and you've got to go yep you're right i blew it right there i need to fix it let me go fix it because That's then they shift wow. because then they actually believe what you're saying yeah. 
Well, it's great training too, because there are times in life where you need to kind of respectfully disagree with your superior or, yeah. you know, you bet. kind of push back and think, you know, yeah. th you that's going to happen. And if I'm <laughs> so saying, that's a skill set you need to develop as well. If you do and I don't do it, then I'm not leading. I need somebody to call me out. So again, when the whole family can do it because it is just we do, we can all call each other out kindly and respectfully. We're learning the skill of calling somebody out kindly and respectfully, but we're also testing those boundaries and going, do we all actually believe this standard? Yeah, we do. Cool, man. So we're all going to hold it right on. It changes everything. I love it. So good. Yeah, I think uh, we're all going to go take that and make sure we're implementing that. It's great. It's not easy, man, but it's 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 it gets easier. It's the foundation. You set the foundation, that becomes just the way you guys view. It's yeah. like everything else. You set the foundation for it. That can be harder. But once the foundation is set, it just becomes who you are. It just becomes what you do, right? The old habits, old habits can't be avoided unless they're replaced, right? So you right. replace I just personally hate hearing though that oh it's so hard to do this from people you know because like this is your one chance to raise the next generation so i don't care if it's hard don't screw it up you know and i'm not perfect i'm trying to be better every day be better every day try and be better every day do everything you can because i mean it's your yeah. one shot that's all you get yeah. and so th this is the most important thing you're probably going to do on the planet you know there, there are the select few who cure a disease or whatever, right? Yeah. I'm probably not one of those people. <laughs> so, you know, the biggest impact I'm going to leave is raising my kid to be a productive member of society, a loving uh, wife and mother one day, and, and have valuable skills, like you said earlier, to offer. So, you know, I, I just, if you're listening to this and you've been playing that game of, in your, in your father especially, oh, it's so hard, it's so hard. Get over it. Yeah. Man up. You know, like this is the most important thing you, you can do. And if you're limited in that, you know, there's people have a lot of hardships. I understand that. Fight for this one more than anything else. This is the thing you should fight the hardest for. Bingo. And I, I think how many stories of people do you know, Matt, that they didn't do that well enough. And now they're, you know, they're in their 50s, 60s, whatever, and they live in regret because they didn't. So Bingo. I don't know what else to say on that, but uh, yeah. Exactly. I mean, well, it's no interesting. Fired up. Perfect. I wasn't taught that when you go to career day, they don't tell you that parent is an important job. They don't tell you that yeah. making a great home or, you know, raising the next generation is important. They tell you to go do a job, you know? Yep. So I really was not taught that. <laughs> so that genuinely is not something that I think even a lot of people who are parents genuinely believe that yeah. what they do for their children is the most important. They outsource most of it. Um, yep. And, that's a really interesting mental shift that I think a lot of us need to make because I know I wasn't always there thinking being a father was the most important thing. I thought of it as, you know, maybe secondary or tertiary. So being with you gentlemen has been a huge benefit in that sense and um, helping me understand the importance of it. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, I think COVID had a, a, a big awakening as well because, you know, like there was a, a time where we were in lockdown and my wife and I, were with our kids 24 7 and <clears throat> i was sitting there with her and i said you know i i cannot believe that we we are blessed enough to be with our kids for two months straight and we're getting paid for it and i get to be with my kid every day every minute of the hour and it's like i see these people online like they're they're upset and they're arguing and fighting with their family and it's like man it's a blessing and it's like and i told her i said generations before us never got this opportunity and i said what are we going to do with it right and um she thought about it for a minute. I was like, let's do something with this time. And so we, we were, man, we were really working hard on our kids' development socially and emotionally and um, just trying to get emotional regulation going and emotional intelligence. And man, when we had to go back to work, I hated it. I hated it. Like, I just, I wish I could just have the rich button and, you know, just focus on my kids. So it's like, I, I just pray and hope that uh, other dads feel the same way. I, I don't know other than to say it that way. I say when you find that button, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. Yeah, there's no easy button, obviously. But. Matt, I wanted to uh, let you uh, have a chance to kind of plug all all the places people can find you. 
Um, I'm sure that people are going to listen to this and have a lot of questions and want to get involved. So where's the best place to connect with you and, and the team um, to get started? Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, while we're getting everything put under one umbrella, if they want a website, apogeestrongprograms.com is the best kind of like our holding site right now. We're putting it all under the apogeestrong.com site. But right now that just shows the mentorship part. So apogeestrongprograms.com is great. Um, I'm pretty active on uh, on Instagram, just at my name, um, where you can find us at Apogee Program on Instagram as well. Um, and if people want to, you know, if they have specific questions or really want to take a look at partnering on the school side, whatever that looks like, um, email Fed, uh, and he'll he'll usually kind of filter some of those for me. So Fed at ApogeeStrong.com, um, you know, we can we can get some chats. So again, man, we just want to we want to help families wherever they're at understand that options are there, they're capable. They don't have to have the fears that they likely have um, and that freedom and sovereignty are real things, but you actually have to work for them. Awesome. All right. Well, you heard it here. If you're interested, go reach out. Um, Matt, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Uh, and I, I just appreciate what you've been doing because you've opened my eyes, uh, you know, so I'm going to work on taking action now. But, uh, you know, th this is the kind of work that, we believe in on this podcast and that's why we even started this is to do things like what you're doing and what all of the people you're partnering with um because it's raising a strong generation of young men and women that's going to make our country better um and our families better and, and that's you know way be way beyond matt that's going to have dividends that you'll probably never see but that's that's it just inspires me that's the stuff i love to see so appreciate your heart for that and for coming here and, and being generous with your time and uh Guys, any, any final thoughts? Matt, I think you will... gave me 10 really helpful monomics to think about. I love the way you create examples and uh, and give such powerful um, uh, examples like that. So thank you for sharing those. This was really a pleasure. Thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you for the time. I, I know how important it is. And and uh, yeah, just I can't say, I, researching you, I can't say enough positive things. like. Uh, I just kept being like, wow, this guy's great. Oh man, he's even better here. And it's like, you know, just, yeah, thank you so much for being on. We really appreciate the time. Thank you guys for all those, for all those kind words truly. And, and uh, for doing what you're doing and the honor, you know, honor being here is mine. And, and the biggest honor is if you guys go forward and lead, you know, you're able to take some things away and go lead better and, and lead your families better and, and lead yourselves better then we win. Amen. All right, dads, let's get climbing. We'll catch you in the next one. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Present Fathers Podcast. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Spotify to catch all of our amazing episodes. We will see you in the next one.